wonder-working power in the precious... Incredible as they seem, are not the results of mass hysteria. <laughs> You may wish to adjust the dial you're currently tuned into. The Wrong Station. It's all in your head. That's what they tell me. It's all in your head. Never those words exactly, of course. They'd hide it. The pain doesn't appear to have any physical symptoms. Or maybe there's a psychosomatic element. Or even the old standby. It can't be that bad. But their faces would give it away. The slight squint. The almost imperceptible eye roll when I asked for yet another blood test. Lying on the office floor as pain knifed to my abdomen, legs, arms, everywhere. And yet these were the interactions I savored most, forcing these people to begrudgingly acknowledge my presence for a precious few moments, allowing my body to gum up the works. I allowed myself to be cruel. Pain like mine can make you vindictive. I started seeking help almost a decade ago. Before the pain, I had a promising role at a venture capital firm in the IT department. I paid off my student loans quickly, my savings account was growing, and my partner, well, she was wonderful. I'm sure she still is. I hope. That morning, the last normal morning I'd have, was so ordinary that I can't even remember waking up or eating breakfast. All I know is that she came into the bathroom and found me huddled in the shower, sobbing. I could barely get the words out. Help, I finally said, and my voice was like ragged tissue paper. It hurts. The pain had come on suddenly, without warning, so severe I could barely stand. The hospital was confident. They told me it was something acute. Kidney stones, perhaps? A hernia? Just a few tests to confirm the cause, and then it would vanish with a bit of proper treatment. It had to. Day after day of appointments, ice packs, Advil, opiates. It didn't matter. The process of elimination is an optimistic one at first. But what happens when you run out of things to eliminate? I was slowly becoming alienated from the body of medical knowledge. The pain kidnapped me, dragging me kicking and screaming away from any sane diagnosis until I was tied up in the dark, alone. Most of my days were spent in the fetal position on the floor, with one hand, I would peck at my keyboard, attempting the bare minimum of work that would keep me alive. The other hand would roam over my body, a laughable attempt to massage the pain away. My work suffered. Of course it did. And soon I was jobless. Then my friends drifted away, unable to cope with their own inability to help me. And she left, of course. The mood swings and bitterness brought on by my condition... They were too much. The unfairness of my situation slowly toxified me until every word out of my mouth was poison-tipped. I hated her for leaving, even as I knew I'd have done the same thing. And just like that, two months after the mysterious pain appeared, I was completely alone. My savings would have lasted me another two months if I stayed in my normal above-ground apartment. So instead, I moved to the smallest, darkest basement apartment I could find. I took only the barest of essentials, and yet the move still exhausted me. I spent the first three days lying on the floor, trying to recover. These two small rooms would be my cocoon, and I was determined to emerge as healthy and beautiful as I'd ever been. Let me take a moment to tell you about the pain. It was not subtle. It was not something that settled into my body. It rushed in like a wildfire, leaving me scorched and gasping from the very first day. 
For me, the locus of pain was between my shoulder blades, slightly to the left of my spine. From there, it radiated out, behaving differently each day, as if the pain itself was a living thing. Migraines, stomach cramps, arthritic knee and toes, it could manifest anywhere. But at the locus, the sensation was always the same. An immense pressure, as if God himself was grinding his thumb into my back, trying to rub me away like a dirt stain on his robe. <laughs> you probably think I sound dramatic. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I am. Either way, it was bad enough that I needed to seek out new avenues for a cure. That's why I'd stirred the forums. That's how I'd met Saul. This was before the internet became a monolithic structure, back when search engines were actually useful for finding communities and didn't just show you the most SEO-optimized article from a fake blog owned by a fake website, owned by a venture capital firm that has four war criminals on the board directors. You could find communities back then, or, in my case, create them. There was no official name for our disease. There still isn't. So I cast a wide net and named the forums unbearablechronicpain.com. Thousands of members signed up, and soon we had a few dozen active boards. Most suffered from more common and better understood conditions. Crohn's disease, endometriosis, phantom limb. Then Saul arrived. On days I could stay awake for more than an hour, I'd scan the latest posts. Saul seemed to pinball from board to board, asking for advice in such a vague and roundabout way that other members became frustrated, thinking he was rubbernecking. Finally, after a few weeks, Saul posted about his condition in the general board. It was a short post, written without capitalization, almost like he didn't want anyone to think it was a big deal. I read his symptoms. Reread them. I whispered them to myself, almost giddy. I was his only reply. I wrote, I think you should join the Hidden Board. For a few months, Saul and I were the only members of the Hidden Board. We would message back and forth every morning, describing changes in our daily symptoms. I've got a migraine today, I'd write. Saul would reply, Rough, it's more of a shooting pain down my leg right now. The next day I'd be the one with the leg pain, while Saul was folded in half by stomach cramps. The one thing that never changed for either of us, though, was the pressure. The otherworldly pressure. Mine still hadn't moved from between my shoulder blades. Saul's pressure was just above his pelvis, on the right side of his abdomen, the same place it had been for months. Each day we tried different folk remedies and compared notes, looking for any microscopic change. A few more people joined the hidden board over the coming weeks, all of us from different cities around North America. I was in Toronto, Saul was somewhere in Texas. A few were scattered in tiny communities in the prairies, Pacific Northeast, even Mexico. There was no obvious link between us. We wrote extensive autobiographies in search of some common factor, but all we had to link us was the pain, as if it were both its own cause and outcome. And after months of fruitless searching, Saul suddenly disappeared from the board. He went from posting at least a dozen times a day to zero. He and I had become close. I worried. I did everything my broken body would allow to try and get information. Suicide? We all thought about doing it, putting a final period at the end of our long and painful sentence. The board just assumed Saul had given up any search for a cure. And then, weeks later, there was a knock at my apartment. I wrenched myself up from the carpet and opened the door. Standing there was a disheveled man in his mid-twenties. He was pale and thin as a corpse drying in the sun. His clothes were filthy and ragged. It only took a moment for me to recognize the deep, naked desperation in his eyes. I saw it whenever I caught myself in the bathroom mirror. Saul? I croaked. It was the first word I'd spoken in weeks. He nodded, and I opened the door wide. That first week, Saul slept 23 hours a day while he recuperated. While I could barely sit up for more than an hour at a time, Saul had managed to hitchhike across an entire country. And why? Why had he come to me? I had no answers. I had no money, no space, nothing to offer. 
but still Saul came. The story of his journey was strange, like something from a dream. The hidden board users often shared addresses and postal codes. When one of us came across a possible cure, we would try and ship it to as many users as we could. It was more selfish than it sounds. We were accumulating data points, building the randomized studies that no one else would. Saul had been living in shelters after losing his job months earlier. He'd been accessing the board at a library nearby. One day, Saul collapsed while sitting in the shelter kitchen. That wasn't itself unusual. I collapsed all the time. However, when Saul woke up, he was sitting in the cab of a truck that was blazing north on the highway. His legs ached as if he'd just climbed a mountain. The driver had found him hitchhiking next to the highway and picked him up. Apparently, Saul told him he wanted to go to Toronto. A few days later, he was at my door. And he wouldn't be the last. Almost like clockwork. Any user who stopped posting on the board would show up at my apartment days or weeks later. After Saul came Patricia, who experienced the pressure in her head. After Patricia came Arnold, who stumbled whenever he walked because of the pressure on the sole of his foot. Soon there were five people in my cramped living quarters, then ten, then fifteen. None of them could entirely explain how they'd found their way to my basement apartment. Thankfully, the landlord didn't give a shit about what went on as long as the rent and utilities got paid on time. We'd send two people out to work each day. The rest of us would sleep or scour the internet or simply writhe listlessly as the pain burrowed through our bodies. Groceries were easy. None of us had any appetite. At most, we'd eat a monk's diet of bland lentils on rice. No point in wasting extra money on ingredients we couldn't even enjoy. I used to love spicy foods. Now the thought of them makes me gag. (sighs) Even with all the new bodies in the space, nobody complained about it being crowded. At first, we barely spoke. We even tried to keep to separate corners, even though this was the first time any of us had been around anybody who truly understood our circumstances. I'd been a burden on so many people for so long, I couldn't stomach the thought of imposing on these wan, sickly bodies for comfort. They felt the same. And yet, our bodies simply couldn't maintain their distance. It was natural, like gravity. Each night we would fall asleep separately on the floor, and each morning we would awaken nestled in a pile of one another's limbs, a choice nobody could remember making. Eventually, we stopped feeling uncomfortable and gave in to what our unconscious minds clearly desired. We moved closer. We held each other and were held. Soon this became the new form of our community. No more individual suffering. This handful of brutalized souls would now cling together on the vinyl floor. We could not relieve one another's pain, but we could bear witness. We came to call that mass of bodies the agony. I don't remember where the name came from. Maybe it came from nowhere. The agony was like air to me. I felt like I was suffering every time I stepped outside. The world had already proven itself to be cruel and inhospitable to people like me. But now that I had a place and people to call my own, it seemed downright vicious. People walking the streets with bodies that don't betray them with every step. Conversations between lovers whose smiles are open and honest and don't mask anything. An elderly man, eyes shifting as he listens to his excited granddaughter tell a story. Mockery. Pure mockery. In medicine, I'd stopped going to the doctor once the agony started. I would never go back. I still can't. What can doctors offer beyond shame and humiliation? No. It was the agony for me, forever. I would press myself against the understanding flesh folding myself into it until my anguish was spread across every single body, my legs and arms dispersed like discarded doll parts, until there was no way to tell whose body was whose. On good days, I became so anonymous to myself that I nearly stopped recognizing the pain as my own. Almost. The pressure in my back would always be there, keeping me from pure release. It had been a long time since any of us had posted on the message board. Now that we had the apartment and the agony, there didn't seem to be a point. But a few months later, there was a knock at the door. 
I pulled myself from my spot in the pile and opened it. It was a young Japanese man. He spoke no English. He just looked from my face to the body splayed out on the floor and back again. He didn't need to say anything. I could see from the hunched shoulders and sweat clinging to his forehead like mildew that he was one of us. I opened the door wide and he collapsed into the agony. It closed around him as if he'd always been there. That entire first day, a section of the agony would heave up and down at intervals as he wept. From pain, from relief, and we wrapped him up, our bodies like silk sheets. Later, we would learn his family name, Ishida. He, he never told us his first name. Or maybe he did and I forgot. Names weren't important. Ishida had discovered our online community by chance. He couldn't read English, but early translation software was just enough for him to piece together the meaning behind the posts. And after a few weeks of reading the archives, he'd fallen asleep and woken up a week later outside my front door. More people showed up, arriving from places all across the globe. A city in Ghana, a tiny village in interior BC, Peru, Samoa, Mongolia. They all followed the same invisible trail, like homing pigeons. And we welcomed them all to share in the pain. The language barrier was irrelevant. We'd moved beyond communicating with language. Complex thoughts weren't needed. There was only pain, comfort, and reciprocation. And somehow, for the first time in forever, I began to believe that there was more to life. I woke each day cradled in a net of humanity, and my broken, disgusting heart would fill just a little bit more, pump just a little bit harder. Never have hope. I woke up to the sound of Nate screaming. It was loud enough to instantly trigger a migraine, my first in weeks. I tried to burrow my way deeper into the agony. They came running out of the bathroom. A few people stirred. I heard a gasp. Then everyone started talking at once. The agony dispersed around me, transforming from a heap of bodies into individual standing, shrieking forms. I raised my head to see what was the matter. Nate's eyes were wide. They were talking fast, gesturing sharply with their hands. Their movements seemed wrong somehow. They'd arrived from Germany a few months back after finding the forums while researching the immense pressure in their upper left chest area, right above their heart. Until now, their symptoms had been identical to all of ours. But now, something had changed. That upper left region of their chest had somehow... Puckered is the only word I can think of to describe it. Like the entire area was collapsing in on a single point, the point at which the pressure had always been the most severe. Their shoulder jutted out at an awkward angle. Their head was tilted down because the collarbone had been pulled down three inches lower. It was as if their bones were being sucked down an invisible drain. It was grotesque. It was horrifying. We encircled them, offering comfort, and they collapsed into us, sobbing. After the fear and sadness had diffused across the agony, Nate spoke. You know, they said as they gently tested their newly deformed body, it doesn't hurt more than it did before. Slowly, Nate's condition worsened. The puckering grew more severe, dragging more and more of their body towards that single point, just above their heart. After a few weeks, their collarbone and neck were so out of place that their head had a permanent 90-degree tilt, and their arm twisted out wildly behind their back. Their bones should have been shattered by the torsion, but no matter how bad it looked, they insisted the pain was no worse. Even as they were slowly folded in half, their ribcage and hips being drawn towards the pucker. We never ran from them. We never voiced our horror. We simply held them tighter and tighter until the day they, well, it was about 4 a.m., not that time mattered much to us. Nate suddenly spoke from their place near the middle of the agony. Something's happening. They pulled themselves free, a slow process now that their body was so compact and gnarled. Their thicket of arms and legs, all bent toward a single point, dragged itself out. 
We stood to watch, a street light providing just enough illumination for us to see what followed. Nate flipped themselves face up. Their eyes were calm, no trace of pain or fear. That's not so bad, they said. That's not so bad at all. And then, with a nauseating crunch, their body snapped in half at the waist. Blood poured onto the floor. Someone screamed, but nobody moved. Nate was still silent, still with those calm eyes. Their lower half began to shift, drawing closer to the upper left part of their chest. Their legs pointed towards the sky as their hips dragged forward, submerging themselves into that single point, as if the immense pressure they felt, that we all felt, was forcing their body through a tiny hole, no wider than a straw. But nothing was coming out the other side. Their body was simply vanishing. In seconds, their legs had disappeared completely into the point. Seconds later, their arms broke free and followed, rotating gently as they sank through. The blood that covered the floor now began to flow back toward the point, forming a soft whirlpool as it drained away. Their head went last. Such calm eyes. And then they were gone. Nate had never given us a home address. They'd brought no ID. We didn't know who to contact about this or if they would even care. We returned to the agony to rest and plan. Whatever we decided to do, we felt it could wait. Something told us it could wait. That everything would be fine. The next day, Saul discovered the same kind of pucker directly over the right side of his abdomen. In the coming days, his emaciated body curved slowly over, looping around the pucker until he resembled a question mark. Right before Saul's pulverized body and calm eyes were pulled from reality, Ashida discovered his pucker. And then it came for Abina, and then Grigory, and then, and then, and then. One by one, I watched their bodies crunch up like paper in a fist and vanish into thin air. The agony shrank with each passing day. Through the cracks between our limbs, I began to feel a chill creeping in. In those moments, I huddled closer, pulling the twisted, puckering bodies around me like a cocoon. And then, one morning, I woke up and there was no more body heat warming my face and hands. The smell of fever sweat was gone, replaced by curlicue salt stains on the floor. The last of them had disappeared sometime in the night. I waited for my body to begin its transformation. I dreamed about discovering my head tilted up to the sky by the deep pucker forming on my back. But I always woke up alone, wrapped in a thick coat of pain. I spent my days with my eyes closed, focusing all my strength on the pressure, willing it to finally collapse. Weeks passed, then months. The bills began to stack up, and as little as I ate, the food still eventually ran out. I couldn't afford the apartment without a job, so I went back to my career. IT, it, it's not so bad, I guess. I'm good at pushing the pain down. Most days I can grip my teeth and power through. And when I can't, I can cry in the cool, dark server room. The computer fans exhale a warm air that almost feels human. On my days off, I curl up on my mattress and sleep. And I dream of it. The agony. I don't see their faces anymore, or their bodies. But I feel the weight of them pressed against me. I feel them nodding at me, faces contorted in pain, eyes filled with understanding. It's the only part of my life that isn't excruciating. The old message boards are abandoned. No one posts there anymore. No new users in months. Years now. God, it's been years, hasn't it? I know I'll never join them. I know what it all means. You'd have to be a fool to see otherwise. They all disappeared. I didn't. 
our pain wasn't the same. It must have been different somehow. The entire time, they were community, not me. I was so sure, and yet... I was actually alone the entire time, wasn't I? Maybe I've been wrong from the beginning, about the suffering, about the pressure on my spine that even now feels like it's grinding me into the earth. Maybe it's all in my head. The Wrong Station is made possible with the generous support of our listeners on Patreon. Patrons can listen to The Wrong Station ad-free, as well as get access to bonus episodes, discussions, and more. This week's episode, Agony, was written by Jacob Duarte Spiel and performed by Anthony Botello. Thank you to Debbie Farber, Stephen Drumbowski, Jeff Grand, Trim Alexander Eiderjord, Wildy, Anthony Bucci, Rose Moth, Gabriel Pickard, and Mothman. And a very special thanks to Nate Tila. And very special thanks from last week to Trillington Beescoat and Jillian Moore. The Wrong Station is co-produced by Alexander Saxton, Anthony Botello, and Jacob Duarte Spiel, with music composed and performed on the piano by Elan Citrin, and arranged for the viola and performed by Viola Schmidt. You can follow The Wrong Station on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and email us at therongstation at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>